It's been a while. Thanks for bearing with me, folks. Those of you that have been messaging, asking about my upload schedule, there is no longer an upload schedule, but I'm happy to be back and forth, up and down here on YouTube. I'll keep posting videos whenever I want, and I hope that they can be of value to you. Less consistent on YouTube, which I'm okay with. And if you're interested in seeing more real-time, up-to-date or update photos and stuff like that, feel free to check check out my Instagram accounts. I'm more active there because it's easier to just, you know how it goes. To kind of get us rolling back into, rolling, rolling back into me doing more on YouTube, I think it's time to share my first role. This is not my first role. This is my third role of film, second role of medium format, and talk you through my experience shooting black and white for the first time. Strictly speaking, it's not the first time shooting black and white film. It was the first film that I ever shot was black and white. It was a few years ago, but I, I didn't get around to developing it because I was too scared of the results. Same with all the other films that I've been shooting with now. I've been, I've been quite afraid to do so, but the more you do it or the more that I've been doing it, the more confident I'm becoming. And as you'll see with these photos, they actually started off pretty strong. And because I just really wanted to get my roles of film in for development, we thought we would just shoot out the whole thing in in one seating. Well, to clarify that, it was the first two or three that were done in one day, and then the remaining nine were done on another day. The first few of those remaining nine, I paid close attention to what I was doing, and then the last few of those ones, that's where I really just, I just got proper experimental to just get the role completed. I guess I'll just give you the take home message of this particular film, Kent Muir 400, which I believe is Ilford film. I'm very unfamiliar with film, st film stocks and details and stuff like that, so do please do bear with me, it's all just practice and stuff like that. The principles of a good photo in terms of technical skill in film are the same as those in digital, and I know I'm not giving you any new information there, but it really is clear here where in the images which I took in the beginning, I was really giving it thought, being careful with the light meter, placing the subject, mostly Julia and sometimes myself, really thinking about where the light is, where the subject is, the positioning of the face and all that stuff. And that really, that really shines through in these photos over here. So the take home message is pay attention to the lighting quality, the lighting position, and your subject's positioning to the light source or light sources. I ran this through, ran this through a Yashica 635, a twin lens reflex camera that I'm so very happy that I ended up finding eventually. The first roll of film that I ran through this, I'll speak to you about that at some point very soon. I'm still trying to wrap my head around it. It's one of those situations where I'm kind of hoping for the best but expecting the worst and the photos that came from that first roll which was Ecto 100, I wasn't, I'm not too pleased with but it could be my scanning, it could be it could be a whole range of factors and it's also the fact that I could just be severely overexposing my film in fear of underexposing it. If you haven't seen my vlog on my first time, I, I, that's the underexposing thing that kind of traumatized me, sort of. But so very happy that I have this camera. Um, I'm enjoying the process. I last week ran a roll of Fuji Pro 400H through it and I haven't sent that to be developed yet but I'm excited for those. It is expired, it expired in January so we'll see what happens there. I have, we'll, we'll see. I have this other medium format camera that I picked up on eBay which is giving me a bit of trouble actually. I'll just put, put that on the screen quickly now and you'll see what I'm referring to. There's a whole spiel to that that I'm trying to figure out and I think that I have figured out but I'll keep you updated on that as well. But back to these photos, this film, I chose this film, I bought it in Cape Town. It was 100 Rand for a roll, about five pounds for a roll. So it's one of the more affordable rolls of film right now, the Kent Mia 400. And I don't know what I was expecting, but with a few of these photos, my expectations were exceeded. And I'm very excited for the future rolls of this particular film that I will be shooting. This very first photo over here was an unintentional double exposure. That's when I accidentally take two photos in one because I forgot to wind the film. It's something that I've done a few times on the Yashica 635 and it's something that I'll probably keep doing because I keep forgetting to... I haven't developed that inst that muscle memory to, as I hit the shutter, to just wind the film. It doesn't do that automatically. It's a fully mechanical camera. But even with this double exposed image, 
I think I, I love it. It's, it's Julia's face twice. The second one is a clear indication of how just paying attention to the light source. This was a window light. Paying attention to the subject's positioning relative to the light. Paying attention to the exposure settings. I put the light meter, I used the incidence light meter with the dome on it at the shadowy area of her chin and took that light reading. And if I'm not mistaken, it told me to use F4, but I used F3.5, F3.5, so ever so slight, just ever so slightly overexposing, which was fine. And I'm finding that with this particular roller film, I don't think you need to overexpose like with the color films. I don't know what, I, I have read somewhere recently that with black and white, you don't actually need to overexpose to be safe. I'm still learning and I'm trying to stay away from reading too much or watching too much because I don't want to get too, I don't want to have other people's philosophies or hard rules imposed upon me before I figure things out for myself. I think that's the way that I've, t I've approached photography in general, so I'm gonna stick to that way. So when I encounter an issue, then I'll come, come around to the internet and look for a better understanding of why these issues are occurring. The next photo is probably my favorite one, another one from the same day, window light as well. The sun kept coming and going, so I was quite nervous that this one would be underexposed, but it, in my opinion, this came out beautifully. This image in particular also, in my opinion, showcases how beautiful a film role's imperfections can, or how beautifully they can contribute to the overall aesthetic and feeling of your image. Over here you've got some scratches, you've got the grain, a few specks here and there, and I quite like that. Considering how old this camera is, I'm very happy with the, the detail that you can get of the in-focus areas. I am happy with it actually, when I looked closely, the lens is a little bit dirty. So at some point I will be opening it up, but I'm quite afraid to do so because it's a whole elaborate thing that needs to be done in the taking lens area, taking lens compartment. This next photo, clear indication or just a very blatant example of how it's just quality of light. This was a very strong light. I believe it was at 100%, a 200 watt light and the diffusion the, the big dome, not dome, but like, but the disc of diffusion, though it was big, it was quite close to the light source. So it, it didn't soften the light up too much. And you can see that over there. It's Julia's face is pretty, pretty nice to look at. So that's helpful. But overall, there's, there isn't enough of a gradient to my liking between shadow and highlight, which is what I really enjoy from my photography, um, as you could sort of see in the other images that I showed you. And that's not present here, but that's, that's all down to the light, it's got nothing to do with the film. Using the, the exact same light source, I believe, with the exact same diffusion, Julia took a photo of me, and you can just see how just a subtle change of the face positioning, just a slight tilt of my head relative to the light source, completely changes how the light falls on the face and how that affects the shadows and made for a more pleasing image with regard to the lighting and the roll off from shadow to highlight or highlight to shadow. And the same for the next image, which was we thought we'd try get some hair flip movement. This is a shutter angle, not a shutter angle, shutter speed of, can't remember what the shutter speed was. I wrote it down, don't have my book here. Do I have my book here? I'll put it on the screen, but we wanted to see just how much of a motion blur we got with that particular shutter angle. I want to say it was, 500 but I think it was more like 1 over 125 uh, 125th of a you know what I'll just put it on the screen and as I flipped my, flipped my hair and Judah took the photo we thought that by that she hit the shutter just as my head already gone past so we thought we missed that moment of hair flipping but we didn't it's there nice photo and this is my first analog selfie with Julia. Julia hit the shutter, I couldn't reach it, but that was that was a fun one. I just wanted to see how blurry her face would be, depth of field, you know, with medium formats, even though it's an F4 or F3.5 or whatever aperture value you insert, the depth of field is so much more shallow in general because of the medium format. So you can shoot at like F5.6 and you'll still have a decent shadow depth of field if that's what you're going for. And the remaining three images, well, this one here of Julia with the hoodie is just was just testing out, just having her whole face in the light and then trying to get all those shadows all deep relative to her face. And then there were two photos left to, to take, to make, changed places so that the background was dark and then we just shone that light bright on 
Julia's face just to get a high contrast, not quite my style of photography, but just wanted to see what we could do with this film, with this camera. And there it is. In general, when I'm editing the curve of these photos, what I do is I just try to match the darkest area of shadow within the photo to the border. And I use that as my reference of, I use the border as my reference of what is black. And I just try to get the areas of the photo that are the darkest and I presume to be the darkest of the dark to match that because I enjoy a deep shadow. There's some, there's some artists or photographers that enjoy getting a more matted look. So you raise that shadow slightly. It's not quite what I enjoy in my photography. So just a little, in, I'm just sharing with you what I've been doing to kind of get my black to be the right black point. Nothing revelatory there. This is going to be a general series that I'm working on for the YouTube channel. I think I'm going to call it something like stills rolling or rolling or it's basically different rolls of film and through different cameras. This is just my little reintroduction back into the YouTube space. Taking it calm, taking it chill. I hope you enjoyed this. I hope you enjoyed the photos. I most certainly have been pleasantly surprised with them. I cannot wait to shoot more with Kentmere. I cannot wait to share more that I've that I've captured with the Yashica 635. I couldn't be happier with having found that camera. I've got a lovely backstory to having found that camera in general. So I will be sharing that at some point. Again, thanks. I'd like to thank you for being so patient with my back and forth, figuring a few things out but I've still been making photos throughout this entire time and I'm slowly getting ready to start sharing those again. So thank you so much for being here. I hope you enjoyed the photos and I'm sure we will see each other again soon. I'll catch you in the next video.